Today, we want to welcome James DeRosa to the conversation. Jamie has been leading the way on capital projects in Mayor Bibb's administration since January 2022. His career began in the lakefront offices of Jones Day, then moved down the street to City Hall in the Jackson administration serving in the Empowerment Zone office. He was then tapped by RTA to lead the Euclid Corridor Project and eight years later returned to City Hall as commissioner of the Division of Real Estate. He continued to improve the lives of Clevelanders through thoughtful real estate development and placemaking, most notably leading the team for the Towpath Project. In his current role as director of the Mayor's Office of Capital Projects, he is charged with the weighty responsibility of planning, designing, constructing, and then preserving the city's facilities and infrastructure. Today, and I venture every day right now, he is intimately involved with the development of a 15-year master parks and recreation plan. Outside the walls and halls of city governance, he serves as a member of the Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry Housing and Shelter Board and has served on Ingenuity Festival and Fairfax Renaissance Development Corporation. Add to that, that he is a German Marshall Memorial Fellow. We're thrilled to have you join us today. I'll turn it over to you, Jamie. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me today. Uh, I have to say, this is a very exciting topic for me. And we're just finishing up summer engagement um, with uh, residents throughout the city. And we're really hearing that this is exciting for the residents as well. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm gonna start out with two facts to throw out there. Um, fact number one is that the city has over 1,700 acres of land in 155 parks. So that's kind of our baseline. And fact number two is that 83% of residents, according to Trust for Public Land, one of our great partners here, have a 10-minute walk to a park. And so those are great statistics and, and definitely things that we're proud of. Um, but what we're, we're trying to work on here is how to make that park experience better, how to uh, have amenities and programming that is reflective of what our community needs, and also um, how can we increase the quality of the park space. Um, so as we um, get into the PowerPoint um, presentation, um, and let me share my screen here. Um, I did want to highlight that um, the um, a reinvestment into the city's park and rec amenities was part of Mayor Bibb's platform when he was running for mayor. So when uh, he was um, first took office in 2022, that was one of our focuses to really um, make a difference. And in the way that we um, envisioned that was through this first ever parks and rec um, master plan. So um, let me forward my slide here. There we go. Um, so what is a park and rec master plan? Um, we're looking to get a roadmap for how we can equitably invest in the city's parks and recreation centers for the next 15 years. In the past, it was often a worst first um, type of strategy, usually due to limitations of our budget. Um, we still have limited budget, but we're looking for um, really a roadmap to tell us how to invest in our um, park and rec amenities. A successful plan, as you see here, will be fair and equitable. It'll meet the needs of the community, and it'll afford opportunities to improve the quality of our parks. Um, this plan is split into three different component parts, and I'll get into um, um, who the team is here in a second, but the first component is what we're just wrapping up, which is a community needs assessment, and I'm going to talk about um, what we learned from the community and give folks here a sneak peek into those preliminary findings. Um, the second component that we're just about to start is the long range plan which will establish um, process and guidelines um, to fulfill the community needs. And then the third part is a strategic plan. So it's not only action steps 
to carry out what we learned um, from the community and the long range plan, but also funding strategies. Because as we all know, funding is often um, a big hurdle. I'll give you a minute to digest this page. Um, primarily what I wanted to focus on is just that it's it's a, a, a very broad brush of um, city hall um, departments as well as external um, advisors. Um, so from the external side, I wanted to highlight that we have uh, the Cleveland Metro Parks, the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and the Trust for Public Land as um, steering committee members. Um, and then um, from the city side, I wanted to highlight that two of our staff members have really been leading this charge even before this plan was embarked upon. And that would be Jessica Gift, who's in our public works department, and Jay Raschenbach, who's in the mayor's office of capital projects. And they've really set the table to allow us to move forward with the um, exciting plan that we're embarked on now. So here um, is uh, just a snapshot of who the team is. One of the reasons that we picked Olin, Olin Studios is because they had a really robust team of both local and national experts on this topic. Um, from the local side, I'd like to highlight um, Third Space Action Lab, OHM Advisors, uh, Rhonda Crowder and Associates, um, Neighborhood Connections, and Design Explorer. And um, for Design Explorer, I have to say, I've just been blown away by the type and vigor of youth engagement that they have put into our um, summer engagement sessions. The entire team is fantastic and we've been really uh, pleased with um, Olin uh, Studios and, and the entire team. So we're, we're lucky to have such a great and focused team. Um, and so before we get into the results of this community needs assessment, which is really the meat of today's discussion, um, just a snapshot, um, we just started in May of 2023. The RFP went out in 2022. We got everybody engaged on board and started in May. And we're just finishing up. We're actually in month six, but just a little bit. We're just finishing up the community needs assessment and really focused on um, the results of the st statistically valid um, survey and making sure that we have um, a good um, representative picture of uh, city of Cleveland residents. So the summer was really exciting. There was lots of activities happening. I hope that most of you knew that at least we were undertaking this process. Maybe you received a survey in the mail. Maybe you see, received an email from one of our partner agencies. Maybe you attended one of our events. But as you see here, we had a wide range of activities. Um, we've we have had and we continue to interview um, different um, um, organizations related to this focus. Um, we had um, mailed surveys to um, uh, residents and received 528 responses. We're currently making sure that those responses represent the demographics, age, and, and location spread of all of our residents. Um, we also had an online survey that was on our, our website. We had four open houses. We had uh, two pop-up events at different locations. Um, and then through Neighborhood Connections, we had um, kind of a park in a box uh, question kit that was offered to um, lots of different folks to have um, small group meetings, whether it could be a block club, it could be your family reunion, it could be um, at one of the CDC meetings. To, um, to, to give us feedback on um, impressions of park and rec in the city of Cleveland. And then finally, as I mentioned, Youth Explorer did a variety of different um, youth workshops throughout the summer. Um, and what I wanted to highlight here too is that um, even though we had different ways of asking for information, it all correlated to the questions that were in the statistically valid survey. So that if you were at a pop-up event and there was a, um, a board up that you would put a sticker on for different preferences, those preferences related um, directly back to the questions that would have been in the statistically valid survey. And as I mentioned, we're, we're currently compiling all that um, and actually analyzing all that data currently. So I'm gonna go through a couple of slides here 
to um, talk about some of the initial findings of the survey of just a few of the, the topics to pull out. Um, one question was um, name, um, list four of, and there was a selection of choices for the outdoor facilities that the resident finds most important to, to them and to their household. And so just to orient you to what you're looking at here, the bold number at the end of, of the graph is the percent from the statistically valid survey, the mailed copy of the survey. And you can see in the different colors, the, the first, second and third and fourth choices. Um, and then off to the right of the screen, there are different ways that we also receive that data. Each of those are color coded and that color coding corresponds to the numbers that you see um, next to the percent. So for instance, the first line paved multi-use paths was also 41% of the statistically valid mailed survey. The response was paved multi-use trails. It was also the number one in the online survey. So um, what we found through these um, techniques was that um, paved multi-use trails and unprogrammed green spaces um, were responded to as the most important outdoor facilities. There were a heck of a lot more choices um, after uh, water play features, um, but the numbers really trailed off without a lot of consistency with first, second, third, or fourth choices. So um, these are um, what we heard from the residents as being um, most important for outdoor facilities. Now, the next one we asked was um, for indoor facilities that folks found most important to them or their families. And um, these really um, correlated to three um, items. Um, swimming pool was um, number one for indoor facilities, walking and jogging track number two, and exercise and fitness equipment was number three. Um, just a quick fact, and let me get my numbers right here, but um, swimming pools um, in the city of Cleveland, we have um, 40 uh, swimming pools in the city of Cleveland, which is quite quite a high number um, for any city of our size or even larger. So we, we have quite a few swimming pools, which makes it challenging for maintenance as, as folks can, can, can assume. Um, so the next slide here is, um, which of the four programs and activities do residents find most important um, to you or members of your household? So with this one, it was interesting because as you recall, we had, um, we had um, respondents um, of all different ages, um, locations, abilities, and senior programming for ages 50 and over was uh, tied as number one with um, aquatics and aquatics would relate to the, you know, the. Uh, uh, the need for, for pools or the preference for pools. Um, also arts and crafts classes and fitness and wellness programs. And then um, the last um, statistic that I'll share um, is we asked them if, if, um, if there were other non-recreation resources at a park or a rec center, mostly a rec center, what would folks um, what would folks prefer to see? Um, number one, public health services, closely second, mental health services, and then housing services and employment services. So the city of Cleveland has really been focused on um, recreation centers to be more than just rec centers and to be neighborhood resources. And this um, really resonates. Um, you know, we see that this is resonating because, folks are asking for additional public health and mental health services incorporated into our recreation centers. And I would like to note yesterday, maybe by chance or maybe not, but yesterday was the National Walk to a Park Day, but it was also the World Mental Health Day. Um, and so Mental Health Awareness Day. So there's um, definitely a correlation between um, good mental health and access to open space, green space activities, um, and so um, it's it's telling that those are the two of the top choices here. Um, so the last um, slide here before we turn over into the question portion is 
just to let folks know that we do have a website specific to our Park and Rec Master Plan, and it's up on the top left portion of the screen, cleparksrecplan.com. So cleparksrecplan.com. Um, and if you um, go to the website, it'll be a great way for you to stay engaged um, and see what the next steps are as we um, continue to um, create data, move into the master plan, and then into the strategic plan um, portions of, of the project. Um, and also I'd like to offer anyone that wants to, to contact me directly, we're happy to add you to mailing lists as well. Um, so that as we get into more public engagement in the late winter and springtime, um, you can be a part of those activities as well. So with that, I would like to um, stop sharing and uh, turn it back over to the group. Jamie, thank you so much. And before we dive into the questions, um, there's actually been a request if we might be able to share your slides with the group afterwards, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. There was a lot of data in a few of those slides that would be helpful to take a look at at your leisure. So I'm happy to. Wonderful. We will make sure that that is in the follow-up email. So you mentioned uh, the idea of equitable access and how are you as a department through this process defining equitable access? That's a, it's a good question. Um, our city has grown in um, different ways over the years so that we have a lot of recreation uh, facilities, parks and rec centers in certain parts of the city that may not be growing at the same rate as other parts of the city. We, we often hear that the, the West side has fewer rec centers and more people and the East side has a heck of a lot of rec centers, but people are, are not as populous as it used to be. So it's, it's not just um, making sure that amenities are where um, the, the folks are currently living, but it's also making sure that you have a safe and welcoming way to get to a park or a rec facility. And it's also looking at maybe not creating more parks in a certain part of town, but maybe um, maybe connecting residents with a park with say a trail or a multi-use path. So I think that we're we're both looking at um, the current realities of our population, but also how to make the parks and rec more welcoming and more safe for all ages and all all all, all abilities. So you mentioned the idea of making the parks safe and rec center safe. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the perceptions that you see around the safety and some of the things that you're starting to work on? Yeah, so um, we currently have um, a couple parks that are in design. And um, one of the things that we're hearing from specific community engagement on those parks is that um, the entry to the park is kind of obscured, that it's not necessarily a welcoming place for um, folks of all ages to recreate in. Sometimes you might have a basketball court that's right next to a playground, different infrastructure changes that we, as we look at um, specific parks can make those changes to. Um, we're also hearing a lot from the community that if we had, um, if we had um, um, safety ambassadors, folks that were outside in the facilities, whether it's outside of a rec center or outside into a park, that that would make feel, residents feel more safe. We're also hearing that if we rolled out our um, camera program um, into all parks, which we do have at most rec centers, that that would also be um, a help for residents to feel more safe. And I think it's it's not so much um, it's it's not always um, you know um, safety as much as comfort and feeling welcomed and feeling that this is a place for you. Um, as well as, uh, you know, your your neighbors. Does the administration still plan to create a standalone parks and rec department? And if so, what are the next steps with that? Um, yes, we do. And, and that is folded into this um, consulting engagement. We have um, two things happening right now. One is we have um, the Olin Studios team giving us recommendations of how to structure a new park and rec 
department. So primarily there would be an initial start of folks coming from other departments to create this new department. But then there would be the need to scale up in certain areas to increase staff in certain areas to, um, to really make it um, uh, um, you know, a national leader in how, how park and rec departments are set up. That's one side of the puzzle. The other side, we're fortunate enough to have assistance from Trust for Public Land to look at how we can fund a park and rec um, department and not, not just the staffing, but also all of the strategic imp improvements that we hope are, well, we know are gonna come out of this plan because uh, having a plan um, with the same amount of resources would be one step forward, but increasing the resources that we can put into both the department and the facilities would really um, be what we need to make a big difference. And along the same line of resources and staffing, the idea of shifting rec centers to be a bit more comprehensive in the services provided seems that it would require quite a resource shift, both the facilities, staffing, culture. How do you address these types of needs? Um, so it is something that the city has already embarked on. Um, so, um, you know, the, the a, a simple thing, if you will, that was done is that the the name of all recreation centers are um, resource and recreation centers. So the, the, now the, the, the challenge is to put those additional resources in the physical structure that, that used to be just the rec center. Um, we have, um, our, um, um, youth and family services focus and trauma care focus in our recreation division, um, which is, um, something that I'm not, um, on a day-to-day -day basis on, but I know that there's a lot of um, special training and special um, uh, recognition of needs that goes into that type of um, uh, recreation center employee. And it's not an easy thing to address, but we are head on trying to add additional resources. And I believe just on Monday night, money was put into um, additional um, um, mental health services um, for Cleveland residents um, through an initiative um, that was just introduced on Monday. So I, you know, the, it's not an easy answer, but we're definitely um, starting to address it because that's part of the puzzle of making um, all of our residents um, healthy. Will the city work with the County Land Bank and other stakeholders in assembling land to help meet the land needs portion of the plan? Um, that's a good question. We um, we have a great relationship with the county land bank and our, our land bank. We have a tremendous number of parcels in it as well. So one step that we've already taken is we've identified which um, city and county land banks are contiguous to our parks and which of those parcels would make sense to transfer over to the permanent public use, which would be the, the park or the rec center. So um, we have not um, um, we have not um, initiated those transfers, but we've done the analysis to see where that makes sense, and that's part of what the Olin team is reviewing as well. And really, the key is um, you know creating more parks creates more maintenance responsibilities, obligations. So you really want to put the right resources in the right locations, and that's that's you know part of the analysis of this plan. So how will the parks work to address stormwater management and work to identify parks by their Cuyahoga River sub-watersheds? Good, good question. Um, one of the things, the initial um, comments that we heard from our, our consulting team is that the city of Cleveland has a heck of a lot of grass that we mow. <laughs> and some of our parks are quite large. And um, the suggestion was, have we considered more natural areas? Have we considered um, being more stewards of our natural resources versus providing, uh, a, you know, a cut lawn for folks to enjoy. And that is an idea that we're pursuing. And I, I, I think that it, there's um, a lot of merit in it because really we are, um, you know, the, the more we can do with stormwater management in our parks, the more it's going to help um, the sewer districts projects, um, as well as just the, the communities um, around the parks with the surge of stormwaters that happen at different times. 
Can you speak to the plans to address the recreation and wellness needs of people with disabilities in providing equal access to the rec programs in the city of Cleveland? I'm probably not the best one to speak to that, but I do know that it is part of our analysis. I do know that the draft plan for uh, a park and rec department has um, a staff member, if I recall right, one staff member that is specifically focused on that particular need. Um, I know that it's um, highly important, but also highly technical in how to um, address um, those needs on an equitable basis. Um, so I know it is part of our planning process um, and something that we're incorporating into that, that department. How will the partnership with Cleveland Metro Parks work to train future city employees, thinking specifically lifeguards who might also have EMT skills? Yeah, well, I'll tell you the one thing that we love, um, and I'm going to divert a little bit from your question, but one of the things we love is that they have um, volunteer um, stewards or volunteer coordinators. Um, as, as you may know, the Metro Parks has a tremendous number of volunteers that really help um, do a lot of things that could be on the staff's plate, but really is a lot more enriching both for the Metro Parks and the volunteers. So we've heard that it's really difficult to navigate the city's bureaucratic process if you simply want to plant flowers at the park that's at the bottom of your street. So we're looking at how to replicate some of um, the Metro Parks's programs to make it easier to navigate our system and also better engagement on an ongoing basis with the residents. Um, I'm not sure that I've thought about the connection with lifeguards and EMS. I do know that we have trouble um, having um, sufficient number of lifeguards. Uh, it's a pretty cyclical um, uh, type of employment, both on a yearly basis, but also sort of what's in 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 vogue for 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 kids to want to do. And it's it's difficult right now to to hire sufficient lifeguards and and to keep our pools open for the entire season, um, specifically because we we just don't have enough lifeguards. So Jamie, as you look ahead, what challenges do you anticipate with implementing the planning process and how can those of us on today's call help you work through those challenges? So I, I feel confident that the Park and Rec uh, Department will be created, it'll be established. I think the, the challenge is how do we fund the improvements that are going to be recommended um, from this um, Park and Rec Master Plan. I have hope that our work with um, TPL is going to um, show us some new um, methods of um, of securing funding that we haven't explored yet. Um, but I would say that um, right now, the most way the the most important way that folks can assist would be with um, as you see. Um, more engagement happening in the winter and the fall, getting the word out to your network. And then um, I think that, um, you know, as we um, get into these um, action steps, as folks have experience with those, any of those steps or experience with other cities, please tap into us. We're in a learning mode right now. And some of you may have already uh, learned those lessons that we'd like to um, benefit from. Jamie, thank you so very much for spending time with us this afternoon, and thank you for the great work that you are doing on behalf of all of Cleveland's residents. We're truly, truly grateful, and we look forward to seeing it all come to being. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for having me here today.